So hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Gutman. I am a professional genealogist. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, I have actually been doing, I, I like to think that I look young. Um, I'm 38 years old and I started doing this 25 years ago. And the reason that's important is because I was doing this before the internet came about. Um, and by the way, as I'm talking, please feel free to uh, take any pictures or anything to get this information because all this is for you. Um, this is a letter that I wrote when I was, uh, I believe I wrote it in here. I think I said I'm 14 years old and I'm tracing my family history. I save all my papers. So this was me when I was 14 years old. And actually um, my family lived right by where the Tenement Museum was. And uh, this is a church I was trying to get information from. And when I was growing up, I used to go to, I would beg my parents to take me to the libraries and I would look through old microfilm. And I would also, they would get so mad at me because I'd call up the operator and I would ask them to please give me the addresses of churches in certain areas. And then I would write them down and then I would hand write or on the computer, write all these letters to churches asking for information because as I'm sure many of you know, you know, the internet's are in the you know, grand scheme of things, the internet's a relatively new thing. Um, so you really, if you've been doing genealogy for a while, um, I'm sure you've sent out letters in the past uh, to try to get information from things. So the reason I wanted to show you this is because, because of the internet, we've gotten a little bit spoiled um, and sometimes you kind of have to go back to like the boots on the ground genealogy to really kind of focus on getting some information that's not out there. Um, so as of 2017, only 10% of genealogical records were available online. Now I will say that as of the end of this year, uh, that percentage is increasing dramatically because in Salt Lake City, they have the big family uh, history library. And the goal of the library is that by the end of this year, all of their microfilm is going to be available online um, on the Family Search website, which is really, really exciting. Um, they haven't indexed it all yet, which is going to take some time, but they are putting the images up there. And you can access this from home. And also to your library is also a family search library. So sometimes if you're on family search and you see image available um, at a family search center, you can go to your library and you can check out these really great um, resources. Sometimes you'll see vital records with your ancestors real, uh, original signature on it, which I think is really exciting. Um, so when we're looking at things, especially if we're going to be searching offline, that's going to take a little bit longer. The key is to find out what you want um, and to kind of start building a research plan. Um, because, you know, you don't want to just start writing away to churches and saying, okay, I think my family's from here. Can you please give me a list of everybody who may have that last name? Well, if you're writing away to these places, uh, some of them will only do a, an inquiry for you for maybe two names or so, because these people have other things to do. <laughs> so you wanna really be very specific about what you're asking. Uh, try to narrow down timeframes, narrow down names as best as you can. And by having an idea of what you're actually looking for, that'll, it, it sounds silly, uh, but that'll give you greater results back. So we want to kind of really focus on setting some research objectives for ourselves when we're doing genealogy, whether it's online or offline. Um, so some things that people come up with is uh, tracing my maternal great grandmother's line back three generations, uh, locate where in Ireland my family's from, uh, provide a direct link to my patriot ancestor, obtain Italian citizenship through a paternal great-grandfather, discovering who an unknown father was um, of a great-great-grandmother. Does anybody here have any uh, specific research topics that they've been looking over in the past few years or currently looking at? Feel free to come in and share or 
write it in the chat. There. Yes. Um, I've been, um, uh, I found that a lot of, three of my direct lines are from Germany, mm -hmm. which has been, wow, really difficult, but I found out through um, Family Search that there are groups um, of different um, communities and uh, the German genealogy community there actually will translate documents that you put up for them, which has been real helpful. But the main one here is um, my maternal grandmother's, one of her two brothers was kind of a ne'er-do-well. Um, he got involved with the ponies and was always looking for money and stuff. And all I have about him, all my mother knew about him was that, I mean, she'd met him, but um, the only thing she ever knew about him was that his wife's name was Lala. L -A -L -A. Oh. <laughs> And she left him. I think there might have been uh, one or two children also. And I just, I, I can't, I, I've got two census records with him still in the household as a boy, but no idea. I can't find anything else. So that's that's the current challenge. <laughs> so it's it's great that you have some names already in there. Mm -hmm. um, you have an area. It sounds like you have like an area where this person's coming from, right? Yeah, in Brooklyn, Queens, Connecticut, yeah. you know. Yeah. So that's already, you know, setting a scope um, of a direction that you want to look mm -hmm. at. So that's great. And hopefully we can give you some clues about some spots to look at. So too, I'm always looking. I've been looking for nine years for this guy. He's, All right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, hopefully this will kind of help you out a little bit. Thank you. Um, so some of the things when you're looking around, you want to actually really first look in your own attic or maybe a parent's attic. Um, a brother or sister's attic to see what's in there. Uh, because a lot of times we save old documents, uh, whether it be letters, pictures, all these things are gonna kind of give clues to what you're looking for. I had found, um, I was just going through some old papers of my grandparents and in their 25th wedding anniversary book, there was a letter. And the letter was from my great grandfather to my grandfather. And it was documenting all about how he, since none of his kids had an interest in farming, he was selling his farm uh, to the state of Pennsylvania and it now became Prince Galitzin State Park. And it was such an interesting find and finding this information, I was then able to go and look at the land records that how he had documented it um, and sold it to Pennsylvania. Uh, which was really interesting, I thought. Um, also too, if you're looking around for maybe you've inherited some old jewelry, check out old pictures because sometimes you might see you know, people from the 1800s wearing this jewelry that you found and that kind of gives you an indication of, wow, this belonged to this person and placing it. Um, also old toys sometimes. And of course, just talking to family members um, and, I know it's, it seems kind of obvious, talk to your oldest family members, but also talk to the younger people because you never know if maybe there's a 13 year old who spends a lot of their spare time looking at records and has a, has a fascination with dead people and they just might know a lot. So just talk to everybody um, to try to get some answers. Um, family Bibles. If you can find a family Bible, that's a real great treasure trove um, because that's where people used to plant their family trees. They would go in the family Bible and they would have the pages where they would write down the birth and marriage of death of people, baptisms. Um, they might say where they, if, where they were worshiping, um, a church. Sometimes they write down where people are buried. It's so great. I had found this, um, actually, I didn't find it. Um, a this is the family Bible here of my great, great grandfather. And it has been passed down and my cousin currently has it, which I'm totally jealous of, but he's nice enough and he's sent me all the pictures. And it really records, you know, the birth of all their children um, and also where some of them have passed away. And it's just such a great treasure trove of information. And you can use that also as a jumping off point. Um, this in particular here, this fan, I, had been searching for a very long time for a marriage record for my great-great-grandparents. And I couldn't find one. 
And I found their family Bible and I looked here that their marriage record, that they were married in August, uh, the second day of August of 1863. That's their own handwriting, I believe. And by using that information, I went and I looked at the local churches where I found that their children had been baptized because they had wrote down where the children were baptized. And I went into that church's record and I went under the date because before I was just looking under the last name and it wasn't there. Um, and sure enough, the person who had recorded their names had spelt it B-E-K-E-R instead of B-A-K-E-R. Um, so by finding this family Bible, I was able to look at the church records in a different way and I was able to find their marriage record, which was really exciting. Um, so again, these are all kind of clues of where to look for other information. So how do you know where to look? Uh, make a list of facts that you already know. Um, so I believe it's Lorraine, right? Okay, so you said how you already knew that they're from Brooklyn. Um, you have, even though it's silly, you have their last, the, uh, the spouse's last name. Um, write down okay. everything that you possibly know about these people. Now that was actually her first name. It was her nickname, Lala. Lala, okay. <laughs> It was, really it was her last name. It would have been a little easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like, even, even if it's like a silly name, whatever, whatever name they're going by, you know, just write down as much information you have because you never know what might stick out. Um, even people's occupations that might help track. You might, one of my uh, husband's ancestors was a sausage maker and that helped me. He had a very common name. Uh, but the fact that he was a sausage maker, I was able to track him through the census records uh, because he put that down every year. So when you're looking at inf um, trying to find things, census records are going to be your best friend. Um, that's a great place to look for things. And I'll show you how to do that. And keep in mind that if you can't find something in a town where you're pretty sure an event happened, uh, remember that borders change. Um, and that's really important because um, you know, originally, I'm trying to remember here. So it's Nass Suffolk, I'm not originally from this area. That's what I'm trying to remember. Um, Suffolk area was Suffolk County, which originally Nassau County, I believe. Um, and when it became Suffolk County, um, some of those records still stayed in Nassau. So it didn't transfer over to Suffolk. I believe that's right, right? It's not the other way around. I think it's that way. Yeah, you know what? I'm not 100% sure. Okay, so don't, don't put money on this. But either way, <laughs> um, so a lot of Suffolk records are still in Nassau County. Um, they didn't switch over when they had that border change. So keep that in mind when you're looking at things. Um, I'm doing a project later for somebody and I, I found out uh, some of their information was in Carroll County, Maryland, but Carroll County, Maryland was Fredericks County originally. So now I have to go into Fredericks County to look for information. Um, so how do you find out if borders are changing? Uh, you wanna research maps and atlases. Um, there's also a great site, it's called the Family Search Wiki. And if you go Google Family Search Wiki, if you go to Family Search, I find it gets a little bit confusing, but uh, Family Search Wiki, and you go in there and you can put in any town um, pretty much in the world. And it will give you some great information about that town. Um, it'll tell you when the town was established. They'll tell you uh, what are the earliest records that are kept for a certain town. If the town at any other point was something else, um, it might also tell you some of the cemeteries and some of the churches that were in the town. So it's a really, really great resource to use as the family search wiki. Um, the family search wiki also, you know, I'm just going to show you this because it's, I'm talking about it. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> so hold on a minute. Let me uh, unscreen share here. And oh, hold on, sorry about that. Any questions as I'm? We oh. do have um, Carol in the chat is looking to find the parents of her Italian grandfather who was abandoned in 1906 and immigrated to the U.S. in 1925. Oh, okay. And she says that um, she has just about everyone in the town. She thinks he was born in in her tree. However, no one has his surname. 
She's done ancestry, uh, family tree DNA, 23andMe, et cetera, and match DNA matches to her tree, now trying to map who the likely parents might have been. She has no records of him in the US. Okay. Actually, I do Sounds like a brick wall. Sounds like a I big do, old brick I wall. I specialize in Italian American <laughs> genealogy. So, um, yeah, I get, I can send you my email. We can, I can see if I can help you out a little bit with that. Um, was he, it was in Italy that he was orphaned? Or he was in, did you say he was in it, in America? I believe in the chat she said, yes. um, abandoned. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Do you know if he was left on the wheel? Oh. Do you know what I mean by that? Did you hear me? Did you hear, I'm sorry, did you? It, do you know if he was left on the, uh, do you know what I'm talking about, do you, uh, on the wheel? I think I muted you. Oh, uh, me? Yeah. Uh, there's something called the wheel in Italy and what they used yeah. to do. Yeah, they used to put the babies on this wheel and a lot of times they were located in convents and they would knock on, it's like L L Lazy Susan and they would knock on the- um, The church on the church yeah and they would spin the wheel and then they would find the baby sometimes they have um sometimes they've created like almost like fake uh birth records for them yes um, was the and last name esposito by any chance not esposito but um castello meaning little castle okay so it was perhaps something that was in the town that they named the child after same okay. situation with my husband's grandfather as well have you looked at the italian archives website yes Okay. The towns don't have all their um, digitized records yet. They're small little towns, so more to come. Uh, uh, message me later and I'll see if I, what I can do to help you out there. Okay, thank you. Sure, absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to uh, hop over here because I want to show you the Family Search Wiki. Uh, this is a really great place to look. So if we put here, Suffolk County, New York Genealogy, okay. And what it's going to do, it's going to give me the list of what's available in Suffolk County, the earliest uh, birth records, marriage record, death records, because New York State actually as a whole doesn't start doing uh, vital records until 1880. So Suffolk County also did it before that. So that's really great to know. Um, oh, this is interesting. So. The parent county of Suffolk County was originally uh, from Yorkshire, so I didn't I didn't know that one. <laughs> uh, they do talk about boundary changes here, uh, the different towns, um, some of the church records where you can look for that. Um, really great resources, so you can kind of click on these things and you can find the area that you're looking for. Um, through the family search library um family search wiki now this here if you go back i'm just going to go back to my presentation here um another great place to look is the cindy's list um and that actually she was a lady she is a lady she's still alive i didn't just kill her off accidentally um and she went and she has compiled probably about a million different online sources uh for different for different areas um, whether it be geographical or even uh, topics like the Civil War. So it's kind of a catch-all. Um, it's not that greatly organized, but I mean, it's pretty much just one woman working about this. So I give her some credit because I never could have done it. Uh, but the Cindy List website has a lot of really great resources about where to look for certain things. And of course, you can always Google, um, Google names, Google places, um, and also Google Books is a really great resource. Um, and before, you know, a lot of times people get really excited because they know they have some immigrant ancestors um, and they make the mistake of what's called jumping the pond too soon. Um, so you want to be able to get as much information in America as you possibly can before you jump over um, into those foreign countries. So one of the great places to look are church and synagogue records. 
Um, a lot of times these church records are being kept before the towns and the states started keeping their own vital records. Um, and you can find some of them online, but I find actually the easiest way is really just contacting the church or the synagogue in the area in which your ancestors were from. So some things that you can find in a church record, um, birth, baptismal, um, confirmation, marriage, divorce, death. Um, in these records here, this is one of my ancestors. It gives the name, it gives her birth date, it gives um, her parents' names. And in this one, actually, it also gives the godparents and one of them uh, took over Carnegie Steel. I found out through research, this guy, um, Charles, he, Charles, I think it was Charles Schwab actually, how he took over Carnegie Steel. Um, so that was kind of interesting. And, and I researched my family's connection um, with the Carnegie Steel Company. So that was kind of cool. Um, but if you want to look for these church records, really Google um, the town where your ancestors are from and Google the churches that are there. See when they were established. And also you might want to reach out um, to the local his historical societies and libraries because they also sometimes have these records there on file, um, especially if the churches um, have been dismantled. Um, for churches that are also no longer there, you can sometimes reach out to the diocese um, and ask them where these records are being stored. Um, historical and genealogy societies also have um, a lot of great sources that you wouldn't, I think they kind of go under the radar. Um, they sometimes contain naturalization records, uh, marriage records, state records, newsberry, news, news, I just made up a word, newspapers, um, cemetery transcripts, maps, atlases, town records, family Bibles, compiled genealogies. Um, I went to in Pennsylvania uh, I was going to Blair uh, Genealogy Society and they had, I was so impressed. It was this little building. You wouldn't know, you know, it existed. It just, you could drive right easily past it. And for me, it was just a tremendous wealth of information inside this library. Um, I was able to see they had done a 100 year anniversary edition, I guess, for the town. So there was a book written in 1899 and it had the parishioners um, from St. Michael's Church, which is part of the town, and they did a little write-up of it. And here, this is my great, 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 great grandfather um, with this picture here. And it just, it tells about this guy, Thomas Wills, um, his parents, just a little bit about him. And actually with this information, I was able to join the Daughters of the American um, Revolution because it gave me that connection of generations that I needed. Um, and it, it's so fun because you can call up these people even if you're not from there. And these people who are volunteers, so many of them, um, just have a really great sense of what is available there. And they could say, oh yeah, you know, I, I know a lot about, you know, the Wills family. Um, here's some information on them. So just reach out to the historical societies in the town where your family is coming from um, and just see what they have there. Sometimes you can even ask uh, for what's called a vertical file, and it's pretty much in a file drawer, and it's just a collection of random things that have been found over the years um, that go with your family. So you could just ask for that, see what they have. Um, cemetery records are also fantastic. I am a huge component, uh, a huge uh, fan of just calling up. I just kind of cold call cemeteries sometimes. Um, and I explained, you know, I'm a genealogist and I'm looking for, I think maybe my family might be buried here. Um, can you help me out? And they're usually really nice. Um, if you're calling a cemetery, don't call during the times where, when a funeral would usually be happening. So sometimes call in the afternoon because I always find that people are a little bit more receptive to that because um, they're not busying with uh, incoming funerals. But reach out to these cemeteries. Um, and ask them, you know, do you have these people in your cemetery? Um, and a lot of times they will be able to provide you with names, ages. Uh, sometimes they can tell you about the people's parents, um, who else was buried in a plot. 
uh, you can find out who paid for a burial. And what's really important is ask them, if you're talking to a cemetery, what funeral parlor was used? Because a lot of times these funeral parlors have been open for generations. And funeral parlors are not, um, I guess, required to be as stringent with information as like a vital record uh, repository. So you can ask them, you know, say it's the Smith, Smith Family Funeral Home. Google Smith Family Funeral Home, you know, in, uh, you know, Port Jefferson and call them up, see what they have and say, do you, do you have a vital record? You know, you have the death record for this person who passed away in the 1940s and they'll, sometimes they'll go in a book and they have the exact information that they provided for the death record. Um, and it's, it's usually free and you don't have to go through, uh, you know, proving descendancy, any privacy laws. So that's a really nice way to get around things. Um, also, sometimes these funeral cemetery records uh, will give you a place of worship. You know, they say that they're coming from a funeral, you know, at St. Raymond's. You can then call up that church and ask them, hey, do you have any sacramental records for this person um, who I know passed away this year? And I know how what year they were born because the cemetery record told me that they were 87 at the time of their death. Do you have any baptismal records? Um, so other ways, uh, bleh, excuse me, other places where you can find cemetery records is the website um, findagrave.com. They have some really great um, information. It's a volunteer-based uh, website. It's free to access. Um, and you just do a search and they'll tell you the names, what cemeteries they're in, and then you can call up these cemeteries um, to ask them for information. Uh, this here, I had found out using uh, these cemetery records, I had an uncle, um, a great, I guess my great, great uncle, and he was killed in World War II. And originally the story was that he had run over a, a bomb in his Jeep and uh, he had died and they left his body in Italy. I had found the cemetery record that, um, that he was brought back, his body was brought back to America. Uh, we're originally from Westchester, um, but he was buried right here on Long Island. Um, and I was able to call up the cemetery. I had found out that his brothers, I guess had, my grandmother's still alive, so she kind of verified this, um, that his brothers had sent for his body to come over. Um, and they never told the mother that his body was brought over because I guess he had been in a few different pieces, um, but I was able to visit his grave and that was really, really meaningful um, to me. So, you know, that's just some, the kind of which makes somebody come alive. Um, just looking yeah, at it. Um, Diane actually had a great question. Um, yep. She wanted to know what might happen to a funeral home's record if the funeral home closes. Are there any um, like guidelines that they have to follow of what they have to do with some of Sometimes those? it just goes away. Um, and sometimes other funeral parlors um, absorb those records. So you can, you know, I think a lot of funeral homes like to kind of boast, you know, established since 1880 or whatever. Um, some of those get them. And again, you can call up those historical societies um, in the area and even just ask, say, do you have the funeral parlor records? Because you never know what they might have, uh, what they might have inherited from them. Um, let me, I'm just saying here. Oh, okay. Yes, that's Carol. Okay. Great. Um, Okay, so one of the other places to look is, oops, sorry. Hold on, I'm just trying to make my chat disappear. Okay, there we go. Um, one of the other great places to look for information is your the courthouse. Um, because a lot of there's a lot of treasures in the courthouse, and it seems a lot of times that it's an intimidating place. I'm always bringing my four-year-old and my six-year-old to uh, the Suffolk County Courthouse, um, and it's 
I don't know if it's a little bit disturbing that they're used to, <laughs> they're used to it. They're looking for, they're used to mommy looking for dead records of people. Um, but inside a courthouse, you'll often find things that you're not gonna find available online. Um, there's land records. Land records are the earliest form of records in our country. Um, and land records are a lot more interesting um, back in the day than they were, than they are currently today. Um, I have some really fascinating land records from the 1790s um, that I guess one of my ancestors had gifted a piece of land to his son-in-law. And he wrote about it, you know, how he married his third daughter and he gave him this. And he really kind of, he actually painted a nice picture of what this farm looked like. And he set out to the oak tree, it extended this far. And by reading, you kind of get a good sense of what that area looked like. And it was almost like a little bit of a story. Um, so it's not as cut and dry as uh, our land records are today. Um, in the courthouses, you can also find estate and probate records. And again, excuse me, these are estate records from way back when. These people are itemizing every item they have in their home. And it shows you what they consider as valuable. Um, and it also kind of gives some insight too of maybe what their occupation was. Even if they're farmers, um, you might get a sense of, hey, maybe this guy focused on dairy farming or livestock farming or you know vegetable farming um, based on the items that they have. Um, they also have you know last will and testaments. That's a great way to figure out who the descendants were um, of an individual. And a lot of times these last will and testaments will also provide you with addresses. So you can start doing some research that way. Um, other things that are found in the courthouse often are natural naturalization records. A lot of times this is um, found more on a larger or larger scale, a uh, larger scale, not so much in your local courthouse, but maybe in a, a state courthouse, um, these naturalization records, custody bonds. I had found one from, I think it was the 1830s, a custody bond. And when a woman had passed away, it, the father actually had to petition the court to, be, to keep his own children. Um, so I found a custody bond of one of my ancestors telling the court that his wife had died and these were his kids and he was going to take good care of them and he didn't want to sell them, um, which you know, blow, blows my mind <laughs> that that would even be an option. Um, and of course, you always have your criminal records. Those are always exciting to read. Um, tax records. And sometimes you can also get the vital records, which is your birth, marriage, death. Um, a lot of times, depending on the courthouse uh, or the government, your vital records are not going to be found in the courthouse. You can found, find them in the town clerk's office or sometimes in the orphan's court office. Um, orphan court doesn't mean orphan as we think it does. Um, it's just another place for vital records. So you can reach out, find uh, the courthouse, the town clerk in the area that your ancestors are coming from and write away to them. Um, call them up too. I always call, I always write. They know who I am by the time they're done with a project, usually these people. Um, and always ask too, you know, is there a search fee? for it and include that um, because these people, you know, this is, this is work for these people. Um, and sometimes they need, do need uh, compensation for that. Uh, this is an example of a naturalization record. Um, there, I do a program on finding your uh, immigrant ancestor and based on the year, um, you're going to find these naturalization records in different areas. Uh, sometimes you can find them through the National Archives, which is a lot easier. Um, other times they're kept on the smaller court, uh, in the smaller court arena. So in a naturalization record, um, I got this one from uh, Yonkers, New York. This is my great grandfather, um, who uh, the person who had asked about, I think it was Carol who asked about the Italian records. I'm an Italian citizen uh, myself. So this is his naturalization record. 
and I'm looking at this and I don't know why there's red lines all over my, are you seeing red lines all over my screen? I don't know, I wonder, I think my son got a hold of this when I wasn't looking. <laughs> I don't know why this is there. Anyway, these naturalization records are really good clues um, to finding other records. Uh, so you can usually expect to find the individual's name. Um, you can also sometimes find the name that they originally went under when they came into the country. Um, so this, again, this is a really great spot if you're looking for a name that somebody originally came under as. Um, the naturalization record, especially the declaration of intent, if you look here, it asks you what name did this person come in as this country as. Um, it usually also gives you their, their, their address uh, when they're completing the documents. It gives you a idea of their physical description. You can see over here the height. Um, uh, this is also a great resource for if you're looking for a specific town where a person's coming from, uh, their arrival date, the name of the ship, um, whether they're married or not, uh, the names of their children. And here we have my, my grandfather was only a year old um, when his father was filling this out. But if he had been older, uh, they would ask for all their children and their addresses too. Um, after 19, excuse me. After 1912, we start seeing pictures of individuals, which is fun. Uh, you can see their actual signature and you can also see witnesses. And sometimes witnesses are really important because they're gonna help you. Um, when you get stuck, sometimes you can look at the witnesses to see where these witnesses are coming from. Um, and that'll give you an indication of villages and towns to look for. Um, anybody have any questions? No, okay. Um, the, again, the land deeds, this is another, ex this is an example of a land deed here. Um, I had got this in the, a courthouse in Cambria County, Pennsylvania. Um, I have physically gone there a lot of times. Um, you will have to physically go to a, a courthouse and peruse these giant books that they have. They're like old and dusty and look at these land records. Now, if you can't physically get to a courthouse um, and some courthouses, they just don't have the time or the manpower um, to go and search these records, you are able to hire um, professional genealogists to go in and search for these records. Uh, you can find people on the APG website, which is the Association of Professional Genealogists. I'm on there myself. Um, and you can contact these people and say, you know, I have uh, some ancestors in this area and I was really hoping that you might be able to go into the courthouse and search for land deeds. Um, I do it a lot for Suffolk County for people all over America. Um, so this is an example of a land record. And again, this is one of the oldest forms of American records. We have colonial land grants, which was after the Revolutionary War. Some people were given land um, at, for service. My, one of my uh, ancestors was given a bunch of land in Pennsylvania that my family then originally um, eventually settled. Uh, you have headright grants. You also have these land ordinance and homestead acts. Um, if your family goes out west, um, they do have a lot of records of that because there was a big push to get people to, to establish the Midwest. Um, and you can find that online, uh, grants that the government have given them to kind of set up these farms. And if your family's even been here older, you can go on um, places like Family Search and you can see if people have um, registered with England and asked for land over in this new world, which is pretty cool. Um, again, last will and testaments, probate records. Um, they're going to show you that description of property, the occupation. Sometimes also, too, with test uh, last will and testaments and probate records, um, they'll state a place of worship. It was very common for when people passed away that they would say, I will provide 10% of my estate to whatever church um, for the repose of my soul. And you can look at these last will and testaments. I know for my family, a lot of them um, left money to this church, St. Augustine's in Pennsylvania. 
Um, and that was a good indication that, hey, maybe a lot of their vital records are also going, or um, sacramental records are going to be found in this church. So then using these last one testaments, they're gonna give me this clue where I can go and find the church uh, that their sacramental records are registered in. I believe uh, Barbara has a question. Sure. Uh, if you wanted to unmute yourself and go ahead. Or if you wanted to type it in the chat, whichever you'd like. Barbara, are you there? Did you still have a question? Um, Hi, Barbara. <laughs> If your audio isn't working, you can certainly type it into the chat if that if that works better. I saw a little thing on Facebook the other day and it said like Zoom meetings are like modern day seances. Like, are you there, Barbara? Speak to us. <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> Which I think is so fitting for, for a genealogy session. Yes. Um, All right, Barbara, if you do have, if you do come up with a question, you can feel free to Put it in the I'm, okay, how, how would you go about finding relatives in what is now Poland? What's now Poland? What country, yeah, was it back before World War II? Okay, yeah, um, that Family Search Wiki is a really great sp spot for that. If you go on Family Search Wiki and you type in Poland genealogy, um, and that'll give you a bunch of resources uh, for Poland. I actually also have uh, sitting right next to me um, the Family Tree magazine. The Family Tree mag Family Tree. Um, you can go online, and they have really great books um, that are kind of like how-to guides. This one is actually the Polish, Czech, and uh, Slavic genealogy guide. Um, and inside these books, they give you the, I don't know if you can see this right here, but they'll give you the archives for certain areas that you can write away to. Um, this, these here are all in Poland. Again, I don't expect you to read this. I'd be really impressed if you could. Um, <laughs> so they also have uh, common words when you're looking at vital records, like the translations, um, they also have sample records, so you can kind of just fill it, you know, pr print it out um, and then just write it in uh, what you're looking for and send that out. Um, and they do have this for a lot of, a lot of different nationalities. Um, again, this is the, fa the Family Tree. Um, it's the tr Family Tree magazine, but it's in their store that they have all really great like how-to guides if you're looking for something specifically. Um, we might have that book here in the library. I know we have a lot of their books. We have yeah, a, you, I, I know a lot of them do. They're really we good. A little genealogy collection, and I know we have quite a few of those sort of instructional books. Yeah, they also have, um, and again, if you have this one here, so you do have parts of Poland here where it's coming from. They have the historical atlas. Again, this is the same people. This one is the Germany one. Um, but I do believe they did take over, they did have parts of Poland in here too. Um, I, I also do, uh, I, I, I do the 21st century, um, tracing your 300 year old grandma with 21st century technology. And I do talk about um, certain areas of certain websites um, that are good. For, uh, Meyer, Meyer's Gazetteer might okay. also. Yep, thank you. Yeah, that's online. Um, if you look for that. And to answer Carol's question in the chat, yes, I am going to talk about obituaries. It's actually one of my favorite um, sources for information. Um, any other questions for anybody as I hop over to the next thing? Um, so one of the most obvious places to look for information for an ancestor is vital records. Those are your birth, marriage, death, divorce records. Um, depending on where you're coming from or where you're looking, there are certain privacy um, laws that are going to be uh, helping you or stopping you from looking for these things. Um, divorce records are actually one of the hardest to get because there's a hundred year privacy law on divorce records. Um, 
if you, here's a little tip to save some money. Um, if you want a birth record, uh, any of these vital records, contact the specific town where the event happened um, and order what's called a genealogy copy. Um, that's going to be about $10 as opposed to $60. A lot of times for these genealogy copies, um, they may ask you to prove descendancy. So with that, that means you kind of have to connect the generations to show that you're related to the person whom you are asking this information for. Um, you can also go on the website Vital Check. I don't like Vital Check because I'm cheap and you know, right away they're gonna ask you for $70 or, or something very high, high price for a record. Um, where I, I find it much easier just to go right to the town where an event happened and request um, a record for like $10. So the difference between a genealogy and certified copy, um, your certified copies are, that's what you're, you would want, you know, if you were looking for your own birth certificate um, or marriage license. Um, you're also not eligible for a genealogy copy because if we're all talking right here, right now, um, we're probably uh, outside of that time limit. So your genealogy copies are really great for like your grandparents, great grandparents. Um, Another question is asking yourself is, do you need the long form of a vital record? I always ask for a long form um, because they have the best information. Sometimes if you ask for a vital record, say you want your grand grandparents' birth record, um, they might just send you a piece of paper that says, you know, Herman Baker is born October 13th, uh, 1913 in Patton, Pennsylvania, and just send that to you. Um, well, for me, that's not enough. So I always check off. I said, can you please send me the long form? And that long form is likely going to include who their parents were, uh, where their parents were born. Um, sometimes it tells you uh, what number child uh, it is that that woman had had. Sometimes it even tells you too, like, which I think is kind of sad, like, you know, how many other children have passed away um, before that child was born. Um, and if you're applying for something like a dual citizenship, um, you definitely would need like the long form um, to have that be accepted by a, a lineage society or if you're going for something like dual citizenship. Um, hold on a second. I just wanna make sure I did put, I did have, hold on a minute. I had, I thought I had obituaries in here, but I did wanna talk about that. Well, I will talk about that. Um, as Carol had brought up, I did have a slide in this. My favorite place to look for information um, is obituaries. Um, obituaries are what I think kind of really makes a person kind of come alive. Um, it gives a little, as I'm sure you're all familiar with obituaries, it gives a little insight into their life uh, outside of that just name date place. You know, sometimes it tells you what people were interested in, where they were coming from. Um, and you can find obituaries if you're actually, here's another little trick to save money. If you're looking in New York, um, the website Fulton History is free and it's a great resource for uh, New York newspapers. I find it better than the website newspapers.com. Um, but you can also go on websites like newspapers.com. Um, you can, uh, our, the library there, uh, I believe you guys probably have a, the database, I think for the archives for Newsday. Um, yeah, we do have, we have Newsday, we have New York Times Historical, which I've had some success with, mm -hmm. and the, um, which I know is free for everybody. It's the New York, New York History, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on it, but um, it was the Suffolk Newspaper Historic Project, mm -hmm. and now it's been absorbed into the New York State Historic Newspaper Project, but you could just Google that and okay. access cool. to them. They also have, I think I have it, oh, this door's locked. Um, I had it here. Uh, you, if you live in New York, you are eligible to sign up for the New York Public Library website. Um, it's super easy. You just go, you send them a copy of your driver's license, sign up for the New York Public Library, and they'll send you a little library card. And with that, you can get into uh, their database and they have a lot of great obituaries for the city. 
I find the, if you have family there, uh, the Brooklyn Eagles really fantastic with obituaries. Um, and you can get all that for free if you are a New York resident. Um, and also to, you know, we sign up for uh, websites such as newspapers.com, um, Genealogy Bank, those are other newspaper sites, but I'm, I'm always a big, you know, fan of looking at what's free. And again, those libraries sometimes also keep obituaries. Does your library keep obituaries or no? Um, we don't because we really didn't have a small, to actually, no, that's not true. We do have some okay. for like the very, very local, local families. Okay. Um, but I, we didn't have a local newspaper for a very long time. So, you know, it would have been like Newsday or something like that. Yeah. Okay. And um, I'm sorry, Kathleen in the chat had a, just had a quick question that ancestry obituaries come from newspapers.com. How do you get around that? Um, you, so ancestry, yes. So a little, just a quick lesson on the world of genealogy. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has a monopoly on um, genealogy. Um, they're very nice people. I, I have a lot of friends who are part of the church. Uh, Family Search is their free website. Uh, Ancestry is their paid. Um, and like Kathleen had said, newspapers.com is part of Ancestry. You are able, if you don't want to, um, if you don't want to sign up for an Ancestry membership, um, you can sign up only for newspapers. Um, newspapers, by the way, they've gotten me a little bit mad over the last few months because they changed their subscription membership. I used to have a regular membership, which was totally fine. And then all of a sudden they started doing this premium membership, which is basically a regular membership. So, uh, I mean, I just actually upped my subscription the other day. I think it was $59 for six months. Um, now the library does have you can access from home their ancestry database. However, you can't get into the newspapers obituaries because they're silly like that, I guess. They just, you know, any way to get, get a quick buck. Um, so you can sign up for newspapers um, and just, you can also do uh, a seven day free trial. So what I like to do is figure out everybody who I'm interested in, um, you know, if you're looking for obituaries, compile them all, get the seven day free trial, look them up. Uh, once you've found whatever you found, delete your subscription um, and make up other names for <laughs> the subscription base too. I, I sign up my husband and my kids for free trials all the time. So, <laughs> so you know, you can get around things. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention is every town, if you're doing research in New York, every town in New York has a town historian and they're really great uh, references. Um, they have a lot of wealth of information and they can also point you in the right direction. Um, and I find they like to talk. So that's that's always nice. And they are usually, they usually volunteer their services um, to help people out. So you can go on the town that your ancestors are from and you can Google town historian or county historian, um, and then email or call that person and just ask them, you know, this is again about narrowing the scope of what you're looking for. Um, ask them if they have any information on somebody or where to look. Um, so I unmuted because it's gonna be easier for me than chat than typing sure. in. Um, as I am an Ancestry member, but I really hate to pay the newspaper.com price if I'm already paying for Ancestry. Uh, do you find that you can find obituaries on Family Search or not? Because I haven't been lucky with that. Family Search does not have obituaries. Okay. Right. I mean, who that knows the future? But yeah. But it, all right, where? What area are you looking at? Mainly New York City, which is very broad and very, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint a lot. But I, they keep coming up on Ancestry, but then to click on to newspapers.com. So maybe I'll do your seven day and then cancel trip. Yeah, also then that works with out. New York City, check out, see where, uh, when Ancestry is giving you this, they usually say, if you look down like the source, look at the newspaper that it's coming yeah. from. And with that, like seriously, sign up for the New York Public Library, the, and you can go in there and check their mm -hmm. databases. Because honestly, I think that they're a lot better than newspapers. Um, Okay. Papers.com. I think they give a lot well, more. Thank you. Yeah, information. Um, and these are some of the Family History Center affiliated libraries. 
And do you have to you have to actually physically go into uh, the library to access the image only, right? Marlene? Yeah, it's actually either our Selden or Center Reach buildings. Okay. They can either um, log into a public computer or they can bring their own laptops or devices and just go over our Wi Fi network. But yeah, you do have to actually be in house. When they come up with the um, message that says, you know, to view this record, please vi visit an affiliate library, mm -hmm. that would be us. <laughs> so sometimes if you're on like the Family Search Library, um, you'll do a search and you'll see like a like a computer transcript and it'll give you the information um, and it'll say v view image. And if you go to the library like um, like Middle Country, you can go there and you can click on something. And this is this is an image for me that had popped up. Um, you know, and it, here's the actual record, um, which is really exciting. And then what I do is I would download this uh, onto a, like a USB drive, and then I would upload it onto my computer or I email it to myself, depending on how I'm feeling that day. <laughs> depending if I remember to bring my drive, that's really what it comes down to. Um, so you can do that. And here's are some other uh, places to go for, oops, sorry for records. Uh, we have the National Archives. If you have uh, New York City records, this is killing me. I really have no idea why this red line is through this thing. And I, my sons do these things to me all the time and I don't know what, I don't know how to fix them. They're smarter than I am, I guess. Um, so the, the archives, they are in different sections in America. This one is particularly, particularly for New, the New York area. Uh, they have genealogy resources, including naturalization records, passenger arrival records, census records, um, some vital records. Um, and you, you, this is their, uh, their email address over here if you wanted to contact them. They're also pretty receptive uh, to phone, phone calls. Um, unless you get this one woman who's not very nice. I don't know what her problem is, but, <laughs> but everybody else is pretty nice. <laughs> so if you email them, um, you can ask them, you know, do, what records do you have? Um, and some of these records are actually uh, being digitized in the process since everything's on quarantine right now. So you can actually search uh, their library at home, which is nice. Um, I'm reading the chat as I'm looking at this. And again, this is the New York City Public Library. Um, also too, if you ever get the chance to actually go there, they have a really beautiful genealogy um, section. And it is a section of the library. Like it's, it's, it's huge. Um, it's probably almost the size of like a regular library. Um, and they have specific genealogy libraries who are there, librarians there who are there to help you out. Um, and you could spend all day here. You know, they just have such great resources. Like you look here, it's really pretty. They don't let you um, look through the stacks yourself. Uh, so you really need to know what you're looking for to request um, the books. So how do you prepare for a visit to one of these places? So um, if you can go online, so say you're going maybe to a courthouse or a historical center, go on their website first and see what records they do have available online. Um, search, so search their indexes. If they have like a number that's associated with, write that down, just be ready for it. You wanna make the most out of your time and the people who are going to be helping you. Um, do plan on, if you can, plan on spending the day there, um, you know, if possible, because you don't know if there's a wait, especially now with COVID, it's really important to call them up and to say, do you have what's called reading room hours? Um, some places, I know the uh, Suffolk County Historical Society is not letting anybody do on-site research there right now. Um, so you do have to mail in a request. Um, be very patient. These people are very nice and they're helping you. Make sure you tell them that, that you appreciate all their help. Uh, bring cash, uh, pencils, your ID, um, your notes and a notebook. Um, you could bring your computer, but don't rely on your computer. You might want to ask them ahead of time if they have Wi-Fi, if they'll allow you to have um, your computer. Some places don't allow photos. Um, so just be respectful of that and what they do allow. Uh, again, call them, um, especially, you know, COVID, I would hate for you to drive all the way to someplace and be super excited about your visit only to have it closed. Um, 
And sometimes with these places, their actual records are not available on site. I had gone to Pennsylvania um, and I had gone to the courthouse and I found these last will and testament indexes for my family. And I said, so where, where's the actual you know, probate records? And they said, well, it's actually in storage. So I had to drive out about 20 minutes to a storage facility. And I felt like I was in like a BJ's or a Costco because they had the giant forklift that came down and they took out, you know, these big boxes and they probably hadn't been looked at for a hundred. I was probably the first person in like 150 years to look at that, which to me, I felt like super special about it. And I was sitting in the middle of this warehouse, you know, just looking at these records. So again, be, um, be open to, maybe traveling a little bit to find some more records. Um, and ask if too, if, if they're able to pull the records for you ahead of time, if that's a thing. Sometimes they like to do that so that it's there. Um, and always don't forget to document your sources. Um, if you're looking at a book, take a picture of the front cover of the book, um, the copyright page, because you're gonna wanna go back there. And I know this sounds so silly, but do it. If you're taking a picture of a page, make sure you get the page number in there. Um, cause you never know, uh, when you might want to go back and look at it, or maybe somebody even generations, you know, down the road might want to look at that, where you got that information from. And just remember, as you're doing all this, that we all have a story to tell and really our ancestors are so much more than just their names and their dates. And, you know, when you're looking for these stories for people, that's really what's going to keep you up at night. If you're like me, um, you know, looking for these these stories, you know, uh, to find and look for those stories in those documents um, as you're going for it. So does anybody have any questions? I'm just looking at the chat here. I'm gonna write my, um, here's my email in here. I can't figure out how to answer in the chat, um, but oh. I saw somebody asked how, um, about the Family History Center in Plainview. That's closed right now. All of the Family History Centers are closed due to COVID. Hopefully they'll be opening up soon, but um, that was the word I just got yesterday at church, so. Okay. Do you know if they're doing any virtual appointments, Lorraine? Do they do anything virtually or they're just completely closed? No, they're, they're completely closed. All of the missionaries that um, run like a, a the webinars and stuff they're all doing it via zoom at home from home okay. um i was uh, the byu family history center family history library does um sunday afternoon classes um i've been going i've been attending them for the last month or so that are great but they're they're all these missionaries are all sitting in their homes um mm -hmm. you know yeah. the senior missionaries even mm -hmm. um there's one who is um a um He's been a, a genealogist for, um, I don't know, 30 some odd years. And um, he and his wife did a, um, a class yesterday <clears throat> on breaking down brick walls. And in the chat just before, he happened to mention that he and his wife just tested positive for COVID. So they're, they're on, under mandatory quarantine themselves. So it's a, little, it's a little rough out in Utah right now. They're having a rough time out there with their numbers. Do you know, was that the, uh, the, is that the LDS church? Yeah, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, yeah. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. great. You know, they're, uh, have you ever gotten out to Utah? I go out there, um, I try to get out every year to go to the library. A friend of mine lives in um, Nevada and she's a school teacher and she and her husband have a timeshare in a hotel right across from the, the big conference center around the corner from the Family History Library. So. Yeah. I go out there for a week or two each summer and we kind of, they're kind of used to us. They throw us out at about quarter to 10 at night. <laughs> they want to close the building up. So, but you know, when you can't get out there very often, you got to make yeah, it. Yeah, it's great. I go out and I work at, you ever go to Roots Tech, the conference out there? I haven't gone, but it's virtual this coming February. Yeah. So I've signed up for that. Yeah. I've worked at it the last two years. And, um, <laughs> And it's, it's great. And then I, as soon as the conference is over, I go and I sit in the, the library. And it's yeah. just, I believe I got an email that it's free this year for everyone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a chance, it's Roots, Roots Tech is yeah. the 
conference and I think it's like February 25th through the 27th or something yes, so, so but you can that. sign up to mm -hmm. view it for free yeah. which I've always wanted to go yeah that, there's so a couple, couple of hundred different classes so mm -hmm. you don't have yeah, to research and pick and choose which ones that'll make yeah, it make I, sense to you yeah and I think they have um some previous year's seminars on their website I think I've mm -hmm. viewed a couple of them yeah. so that's yeah. really helpful I did a I signed up for the virtual one last uh, this past year and there were about 50 classes that I had access to for free. Uh, well, actually, I, I paid like, I think, 40 bucks or something like that. Um, That's fantastic. So a lot cheaper than if you go there in person. But yeah. <laughs> no hotels. <laughs> One of the things that I've been doing is I, when I was working at Roots Tech, I would sit in the coach's corner for uh, this company, Trace, and we would do like, it was really fun. Um, for, we would sit with clients for like every 30, 30 minutes on rotation. And we would like help them with their genealogy work and, and help them, you know, set a plan. And if we could break down any brick walls and that was just like super exciting. I've been doing that too with like some libraries, which is, which is a fun thing. I'm the, um, I'm the temple and family history consultant for my little ward here in, um, in uh, the Riverhead area. Oh. I, I do a lot of, a lot of that for members of the church, but for people who are not also, I mean, I'm just a, a rookie, you know, I've only been doing this nine years, but really have a passion for it. So that's great. Good for you. It's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Except for great uncle Fred. The <laughs> <of> the <post. laughs> um, I, I put my information here. If anybody needs any, you know, has any questions or, you know, whatever, that's my website is the family tree climber um and my email um you know feel free to message me or whatever gets me out of doing my laundry um so <laughs> does anybody have any other questions or anything thank you everybody so much for coming yeah thank you everybody thank you it was we'll great definitely have Sarah great. Back sometime over the winter we'll schedule some more programs great thank you i'll reach out to you this week we'll work on scheduling some things okay. I'll be here. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Marlene. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Speak now. <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourselves and ask your questions now and opening. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And like I said, I, I know I have all your email addresses from when you um, signed up for this workshop. So if we book anything in the future, I'll reach out to you guys and let you know what we have coming up. Great. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Thank all right. Bye. Stay healthy. You too. <laughs>